coming tonight. I think we'll start with um, my colleague and friend Carmen, who can uh, introduce herself, and then I'll tell you a bit about myself too. Hi, everyone. My name is Carmen, and I am a junior um, at Beacon in Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn in New York City. I am on the Youth Advisory Council for NYLC, and what we do is um, basically help out with anything they need. And right now we're working on Youth for Education, which is an education equity program that will be implemented nationwide. Thanks, Carmen. Um, and I know Carmen through her work at the National Youth Leadership Council, um, where I also work and uh, am a former English teacher from middle and high schools in Vermont and California and Idaho. Um, but really happy to be here in Minnesota where I've been for quite a while now um, and delighted to get to talk with you tonight, Carmen, and also with Kelly. Um, so let's see if we can get past this slide. Oh, this is where I may need Amy's help if it takes a special something. Okay. Um, Alrighty, I think I think um, Amy's just Amy's helping me on her laptop. Um, NYLC uh, is based in St. Paul, Minnesota, and our mission is to create a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world with schools and communities through service learning. And this is one in a series of workshops um, that we are doing for, for everyone and also with a subset audience um, that is especially interested in teen driver safety um, through a program that we sponsor called Project Ignition. And so we have done one, one webinar already, um, Service Learning 101, and uh, this one will focus on youth and adult partnerships, um, really the promise and potential therein. And Carmen can say a little bit more about her role with YAC. Yes. So the Youth Advisory Council is composed of three people and Abdi right now. So we are Bella, Zara, and I um, from all different parts of the country. And we've met once in Philadelphia. But mostly we work um, over conference call to plan youth for education and implement it across the nation. Right now we're working within our own communities and soon we'll be rolling out programs throughout the country. Yes, and so Youth for Education, um, I think Carmen will say more about as we go along and it's initiative, an initiative of our Youth Advisory Council, like she said. Um, and let's see if we can also say, this is, this is the definition of service learning that NYLC uses. Um, though there are many in the world, and uh, I guess I just gave you a preview of that coming attraction, but I think the thing worth noting at this juncture is just that um, service learning is a wonderful um, teaching and learning strategy that can be used in or out of school. And um, often, I think it's easier for people to imagine youth and adult partnerships happening in the out of school space, um, but I love to imagine what's possible in schools too. So we often, um, we often start by talking about our norms, and I'm just sharing NYLC's norms um, with you, Kelly, in part because these were developed by our Youth Advisory Council a couple years ago. Um, we always feel like they're a good way to start in a youth adult partnership. Maybe it's something you do as well. Um, and the way that we do this often is to have students imagine um, like three practices that they think will lead to good teamwork or good group cohesion. Um, have them do that first by themselves, then pair and share um, with someone and choose three out of the six ideas, and then um, post them and look for areas of overlap, um, aiming for maybe four to five total. So at NYLC, we really encourage ourselves to stay engaged, speak our truths, listen generously, um, and be willing to experience discomfort. That seems to get us through most everything. So the goals for today's training are to empower students, encourage adults to help students be empowered um, and help students in all their endeavors, and so that both parties engage as partners. Um, in genuine equality. So the reason that we have goals is just kind of to orient the webinar in general um, and to establish 
again, the common basis what, of what we're working on. So some ways to come up with goals um, are discuss what people want out of this webinar. If you want something in particular, feel free to tell us in the chat box and we will address it. Um, but really these goals are just so that we can figure out what we're trying to accomplish here and how best to reach that. Great. So to get us started, um, maybe taking it a, even a step beyond what Carmen just introduced, is we thought we'd think a little bit about um, what our whys are for doing youth and adult partnerships. And I would guess that, um, Kelly, you may have heard of this talk by Simon Sinek, um, who really talks about starting with why. Um, and so let's listen for a moment to what he has to share with us, see if we can then come back and apply it to our youth and adult partnerships. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. <laughs> Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. 
it just doesn't drive behavior. Okay. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you. Those aren't the other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? So let's, let's think a little bit about what Simon um, had to say to us. And Carmen, do you want to share your why for youth and adult partnerships? Yeah. Um, so my why is essentially that I believe that youth and adults work better when they work together. If you combine the resources and experiences that adults have and the ideas um, and I guess lives of students, you get a more effective, more profound, more sustainable uh, decision-making system and program. So that's why I care about youth adult partnerships and why I think that NYLC is so important. Um, and then from there, you can kind of build a structure off of, you can build any service learning project or really anything based off of this fundamental belief that youth adult partnerships are necessary and powerful. I second that emotion, Carmen. And I think um, I, always, I always worry that when we're um, not partnering across generations, that we're missing some of the most innovative solutions. And um, so just as, just as all of the yak often saves me from myself with technology, um, I think about you know, how that can be taken to scale. So, um, so I just hope the rest of you will think a little bit about your, youth, your whys for youth and adult partnerships as we go along, merrily along with our slideshow. Um, I think I'm, I moved a little too quickly. Carmen, do you want to say a bit about the, um, the how and what? Yeah. Um, so on top of this why, um, kind of the belief in service learning and that youth adult partnerships are necessary and powerful um, is the how, which is the youth adult partnerships themselves. So off of this belief, you're building these structures and these relationships to reach the what. For me, that what is youth for ed or, um, or service learning in general. So the what is any project you want to achieve um, and the how is youth adult partnerships. Great. Um, so now we move into sort of um, more meat and potatoes in, in terms of this webinar. I'm wondering if um, any of you who are with us tonight are familiar with Hart's Ladder, with Roger Hart's Ladder. Um, and maybe if you could just give a little plus if you are exclamation uh, mark in the chat box, that'd be great. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll just continue and, and um, delve a little deeper into who he was and what he was doing. Um, this comes out of the early 90s. He was a so sociologist um, and he was working for UNICEF and was really looked um, globally to figure out, well, what are all the different ways youth and adult work? youth and adults work together um, to deliver something effective to solve problems. Um, and we have taken his ladder of um, youth and adult partnerships and, and applied it to service learning, really thinking about, um, you know, what is the, what can the roles for young people and adults be um, in trying to address community needs together? Um, so, any, any, let's see, yes, great. So we've, we've got an exclamation <laughs> mark or two out there. Um, let's go a little further with this. So how are your youth adult partnerships right now? You can answer in the chat box or you can just reflect a little bit. Um, I can talk a little bit about mine. And I think they are 
all over the place. I have some that are really wonderful. Um, I feel like we support each other, work together in a genuine partnership to get things done and others that are very much um, like you learn manipulation or tokenism. And those are often the ones that you see in the educational setting, um, which is one of the hardest things. Um, but I hope you can reflect on your most important youth and adult relationships and where you think they are on the ladder right now. And then we'll learn a little bit more about what exactly the ladder means and is and how to use it. Yes, so while you all ponder where you think you'd place yourself, um, I'll, I'll delve into the first, the first rung that we probably are aspiring to move beyond. Um, but I often think as a, as a former teacher that this is kind of where we get hung up um, in that we think it's our job to lead activities with young people. Um, and so I would say that this is, as, as the definition here reads, adult-led activities in which youth do as directed without understanding the purpose of the activities necessarily. And I think that is just typical of many beginning teachers. Um, and again, I think it's born out of good intentions often. Um, Carmen, do you, have, do you have an example from your life? Um, as a student, I would say that this happened a lot in elementary school for me just kind of following with whatever the teacher was putting forth, um, not understanding the purpose or really my own connection or drive for it. And what this does, or what it did for me, not to generalize, is it took away my curiosity and any passion I had for leadership in that class. So instead of being really excited about learning, I would sit there um, and just do what was asked of me. And that really, undermines the purpose of education, which is to build skills and knowledge that can kind of empower a student to take on the world. So this is not a good run, guys. <laughs> not good. So the second rung is decoration. And these are adult-led activities in which youths understand the purpose, but have no input into how they're planned or reflected upon, um, I would add that. So this reminds me a lot of science labs, which in theory are forums for exploration and problem solving, but in reality often being, um, often end up being following a procedure without any consciousness of why you're doing it, um, how you can kind of actually take initiative and solve your own problems, and instead you're reaching this set data or this set, um, uh, results right so this is really disheartening again because you're doing something that could be really fun that you could care about that you could learn about um, and instead it becomes just an exercise of copying or following directions and that again takes away all of the learning and all of the fun and I think oh I should add the key difference between decoration and manipulation is that in decoration you do understand the purpose. So in a science lab, I understand that um, doing this process will help me learn this other process or this abstract concept, but you're still not taking ownership over it, which is a key part of education and is thus not very useful for learning. Yeah, thanks, Kermit. And I, I think I would add um, in thinking about this rung to just given various workplaces, um, I think often there are mandates to have youth interns and young people come thinking, okay, the goal is to get some experience. Um, of course, I'm being mentored in this role. Um, and I think sheer busyness can get in the way of meaningful partnership. Um, and yet, I, I have often seen young people sort of trotted out um, as the next generation of leaders in those settings. And um, I think part of what can drive this also is sometimes, if it's in a nonprofit setting, the funder um, asking for deliverables well ahead of the experience. And so um, it can be, you know, it can be requirements driving the experience um, less than or instead of youth passion. I completely agree. <laughs> um, Let's see. And so now we come to rung three. And tokenism is probably easy to figure out that this still isn't our favorite um, rung of the ladder. 
But um, I would say, again, it's often good intense driving it. Um, Adult-led activities in which, in which youth may be consulted with minimal opportunities for feedback. And it caused me to reflect on a governor's youth recognition event we used to do here in Minnesota, um, where we were certainly holding young people up, again, as examples of um, hopes and our, our hopes and dreams, and theirs too, I think. Um, but they were not involved in the planning, the decision making. Um, they were simply paraded across the stage. So um, I think this is probably another one where, you know, they're, they're, they may be, um, they're, they may be there in the majority, but they're not leading the activities. Did you have someone to add, Carmen? I just wanted to say that was really good imagery. Um, but yeah, in my experience, this has been what a lot of leadership councils are. Uh, thankfully, the yak is not. <laughs> but um, having youth representation as an image or hearing feedback but not taking it into account um, when making decisions is really hurtful for the students. Um, and again, deprives them of confidence, leadership making, and it deprives the adults and the decision-making process of some really valuable insights. Yep, good point. Um, and this is the rung. Rung four, I always feel a certain attachment to because I really think it's where I've spent far more of my life than, I, than I'm proud of. But at rung four, um, youth are assigned but informed. Um, these are adult-led activities in which young people understand purpose, the decision-making process and have a role. And, um, and I, I always refer back to an annual um, activity I've done with young people in developing an iBook um, called Being the Change. And it is always focuses on the most recent Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And it's, it's been at least a lot of fun for me, I hope for them. Um, we sort of divide and conquer the different parts of the book. And they do a lot of the original research and writing um, they also try out the activities and fine tune them. Um, but I would say that the responsibility and the deadline keeping and all of that, I've always held probably too close to my chest. So um, I think that if this is just one of these examples where I've learned a lot through this ladder activity of how I can climb up it. Um, Carmen, do you have <clears throat> an example for this one? I do not, but I think that's kind of an example in itself that this ladder has a lot of rungs and sometimes they get a little confusing. Mm -hmm. um, so a relationship can be at one point a uh, rung three and the next a rung four. Mm -hmm. And that's a really flexible kind of dynamic relationship. And the good thing is that it's kind of easy to move up the rungs if both parties really work towards it. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means that you can fall down the rungs without really realizing it. So they can be confusing, but if you really try to read through them and figure out how you feel about it and how um, a student or the other adult feels about this, I think you can figure it out and it'll help you understand the relationship and where to move from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we're more than halfway to where we want to be. Um, rung five, um, consulted and informed. These are adult-led activities in which youth are con consulted and informed about how their input will be used and the outcomes of adult decisions. Um, and the example that came to my mind was working in an alternative school with pregnant and parenting teens um, who were considered a real resource when it came to evaluating some state level public health grants um, because often they had experienced the systems that were failing them. And so they knew, you know, they knew what needed to change and they were, you know, great critical minds. Um, I think the, the part of the picture we seem to never improve was that, you know, they, it would have been great if then there had been a way that they could have actually been building some of the preventative activities so that the following year we weren't back in the same position of listening to brilliant youth minds analyze um, these, these intervention strategies and, uh, you know, but, um, but sort of not moving the needle on, on preventing some of these problems from happening in the first place. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. In my experience, um, this has been the case when there's, say, a community service leadership council at my school in which adults really care about the community service experience of the students. 
but they have complete control over the curriculum, over requirements, and over the reflection process. So I and all my friends genuinely did contribute to the reflection process and to planning the next year by reporting kind of our experiences, but it felt like we didn't have any authority or responsibility in ourselves. Um, and that seems like it, it kind of prevents, again, the next year from benefiting from some of our experiences um, and feels like adults don't really trust us in a way, which I'm sure they do. Um, and often being at this rung is not conscious. It just seems like what a typical adult should do um, in our cultural consciousness. But moving up a little bit from this, it will really empower both parties and create um, a sustainable decision-making process. So this rung, number six, is adult-initiated shared decisions with youth. So these are adult-led activities in which decision-making is completely shared with youth. Um, so a lot of these instances are in organizational settings where there are financial aspects or more bureaucratic aspects that are typically controlled by adults, but youth have a completely equal input into them. Um, and I think this is a really good rung if you're here. Of course, it's always good to work for further improvement, but, um, but this is a place where you have resources, you discuss them, and decisions are made with both parties taken into account which I think creates a good decision, but not the best possible one. <laughs> Maddie, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I guess the, the what occurs to me is um, often at, in after school settings, just when it, when attendance can be an issue, when there's coming and going of some, some of the young participants, um, I think the default position is often something like this, um, where there's shared decision making that's a little more episodic. And then, um, but like say the curricular decisions, like you mentioned earlier, Carmen, are often um, made by the adults. And uh, yeah, I, so I, I, I agree, we're headed in the right direction. <laughs> Rung seven, youth initiated and directed, which are youth-led activities with little input from adults. So this is often seen as kind of the chalice of youth empowerment, right? Youth completely run the scene, but in reality, this isn't very sustainable. So an example of this is the environmental club at my school, which is 100% uh, youth initiated and directed. So we do have a faculty advisor who we use to get administrative approval on things, um, and help us when we need kind of like financial help, but it is very minimal. Really, we walk in, we run the club ourselves, we run every project by ourselves, and that can often feel like we're missing out on resources um, or experiences that could help inform our decisions and our projects. So although we do have a lot of power in this setting, it feels like we could be doing more if we had more experience and more resources that an adult could provide. Yeah, I've seen this happen a bit. Um, and again, I think it's, it's kind of um, adults meeting well and trying to get out of the way, but then they maybe become the drivers uh, and, and don't um, offer the expertise they might have to offer um, or just, um, you know, somehow step too far back from even being a guide on on the side so um so it makes me think about a regional non or actually statewide nonprofit i worked with here where i think youth voice was held up high and um just every once in a while i think we adults weren't um interacting meaningfully at least not in the way that we could um so last but not least <laughs> we have mm -hmm. rung eight youth initiated shared decisions with adults. And these are youth led activities in which decision making is completely shared between youth and adults working as equal partners. And my example of this is the Youth Advisory Council with NYLC. So this program is a two year term that we serve and we've chosen to work on Youth for Education, 
which again is a education equity program that is aiming to empower students and communities in um, kind of discrete locations across the nation to create a service learning project that will tackle education equity in their community. So the goal of this is to create systemic change through personalized kind of individual change within um, communities so that we're not imposing one norm and allowing individuals to kind of take ownership over their own systems and conditions. So the reason why it's shared decision making is because on every call, we have the YAC members and we have Maddie and Amy. So this means that every discussion that we have has our perspective based in our experience as um, school children, I suppose, as students um, and Amy and Maddie's who've worked in education for years and um, especially in youth leadership programs, which means that they know kind of what has worked, they know what kind of resources we have and they have connections to other adults. So this means that when we're making a decision, we take into account how it'll affect the students in schools, how it'll affect adults in schools, and if it's feasible and any experiences that are kind of related to it from the past. I think this creates the most sustainable, most effective decisions. And I'm really happy with both the level of responsibility and the feeling of support and community that comes with this rung. Maddie, thoughts? Yeah, I just, I second you, Carmen, on all of that. I mean, I think it's always a work in progress and, um, you know, even technology can sometimes get in the way, you know, but thankfully, Carmen bails me out. And, <laughs> um, and I think that over the years, um, I think even NYLC itself has grown to really embrace this idea. I think we've, we've, we've learned from all versions of possible extremes in this picture. And um, I'm, you know, I'm always cheered by the idea because I think in a certain way, um, you know, it means adults at every age have a role. And, um, and I, I think it brings some of the, the mentoring um, aspects of youth and adult partnerships, you know, the mentoring that can be multi-directional and reciprocal is really important here. And so, um, yeah, I think it's something we, it's something we strive for at NYLC, that's, that's for sure. Um, yeah. One last thing I would add is that um, the first three rungs are not youth participation at all. So those are adult-led decisions, adult-led activities um, that kind of use youth as pawns, I wanna say, um, not as real representatives or empowered figures at all. And this means that, this, that any project that involves the first three rungs are not actually service learning because there is no youth participation. Um, so four and above is what you're aiming for. And the higher you get, the more sustainable and effective it is. But really, whatever rung fits your organization, as long as it's decided upon between youth and adult alike. Great. Um, so I, we just wonder if this has caused you all to think back again, to think any differently about the youth and adult partnerships you may be experiencing. Um, and if you have, if you're working with young people on service learning projects, if you're a young person yourself, if you're doing a project-based learning um, experience, could you just um, put whatever number you think fits you up in our chat box? Um, there are no wrong answers. We just would love to get a sense of, if we were all together in a room, we'd have you using Post-its. So this is our best substitute for that. Um, and it, it, like I say, no, no, not meant in any way to shame anyone, but just curious where kind of where your work you think lies. So as you work on the chat box, it is really important that you present this ladder to your students, or if you're a student, to your adult. Um, this is because having an agreement over kind of the status of the relationship and how you want to make decisions and work together is really important. If you don't have this consensus, you're already not having equal participation. Um, and having a conversation about the ladder will kind of incite a conversation about how you both feel about the project and how you want to move going forward 
So it's good for establishing goals for the project, norms for the project, um, in addition to kind of how you feel about, um, about the youth adult partnership. So it's really important if you need resources or you just want resources, there is a discussion protocol on the NYLC service learning network. And if you're on this webinar, I think you are already on there. If not, I would highly recommend joining. They have wonderful resources. And there's also a youth adult contract, which is not necessary, but it kind of irons out the little details that compose the partnership. And I would really recommend just taking a look at. Great. So we, we just wanted to know if this leaves um, any of you with questions. Uh, we'd, we'd love to try to um, answer them if you have them. Um, as, as Carmen mentioned earlier, she speaks from the student perspective and I speak from sort of the once student, now adult perspective. And um, so if it will give you a moment to think about that and type in the chat box. And you'll see here on the bottom of the slide, the references to Roger Hart's work. Um, it, it is a really interesting report. I would really encourage you to check it out and Adam Fletcher's ladder. Um, of Youth Voice and Adaptation with the Free Child Project. And um, while you're thinking of your questions, let's also do a little shout out for Yak and Youth for Ed. Yes, so if you're a student or you know a student who cares about education equity or service learning or advocacy in any capacity, you should definitely uh, join the Youth Advisory Council and Youth for Ed. So the Youth Advisory Council, again, works with NYLC um, to kind of help out and as a project to involve Youth Voice in other projects, if that made any sense. So again, um, my YAC cohort is working on Youth for Ed. So Youth for Ed is Youth for Education, an education equity initiative, and we will be putting clubs in schools across the nation um, by recruiting lead activists who are really passionate students who care about education equity in their communities. We'll provide you with resources, um, materials, and kind of consultation to figure out what's happening with education equity in your community, how did you get there, and what's a project you can do to help remedy it or establish education equity. And these are going to be unique to every area of the nation, but we're really excited to learn from each other and to work together to kind of conquer this problem nationwide. So if you know a student who's interested in Youth for Ed, we'll be releasing lead activist applications, I believe in November. So look out on the NYLC website for those and the YAC applications, not for a while. We, I have to stay here for a few more years, but I'm really excited for the rest of my term. Um, 2021 will be the next yak. So look out for that. It's so much fun. I get to learn so much and meet new people. It's been wonderful. Um, so I would highly recommend both of those. And please tell any student that you think would be interested. Um, I'm just typing a little response in, um, but we got a good question about how, how we might use utilize the ladder and appropriate rungs with um, younger grades, K3. And um, it makes me think of a, an, a fist to five activity I've done with younger kids um, and all the different opportunities for youth um, leadership in the service learning experience even with young, young children. And I think often it's just a matter of um, simplifying, you know, of course, simplifying language and figuring out where the, the best opportunities are for youth voice in a, in a situation. But I would just say um, to the person posing that question, please reach out to us at NYLC. And I'm at mwegner at nylc.org. And I think we have some resources that could be helpful. Um, including a recent publication on service learning and out-of-school time for younger children. Anything you would want to add to that, Carmen? Um, thinking back on my time as a K through three student, I think that um, they ask a lot of questions. So giving them the power and freedom to ask questions and explore those questions 
is a form of student initiative and student decision making. If you form an equal part in that, um, help them kind of mentor them through the process of exploration and curiosity, then that becomes a wrong eight relationship right there. So how this could happen is a service learning project, a science project, really any question that they're interested in investigating, that's their initiative. Um, and if you can support them, then it would, it'll build a really powerful learning experience and perhaps a cool project for you. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. Um, thank you so much for your question and keep asking them if people, if, if they're occurring to you now. And um, I think the other thing that we just wanted to share with you is our last, if I can make the slide move, our last slide. Uh, yep, which is if you would pretty please uh, fill out the survey um, just to help us do um, better with our webinars. And um, we just thank you so much for participating tonight. And I want to thank you, Carmen, for being so on top of things at your end. It's really fun to partner with someone across the country. Yes, thank you for this, Maddie. It was a lot of fun planning, and I really enjoyed the webinar. And thank yeah, you, and Carmen, I, for watching. And I hope we'll hear from you more. Um, a reminder again that you can go to nylc.org and to the Service Learning Network for those supporting documents that Carmen mentioned. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Night.